Hello and welcome to V Winners Edge. Today we are going to talk about a very important thing that is drama. And we will talk about the development of the genre. And from that, we will get to know about types of drama at the same time. Okay. Uh, I'll not be going to the detail of classical uh, drama uh, because this is an introductory video but then I will have to mention the names okay so here we start as far as western tradition is concerned any discussion of drama must begin with Greek drama classical Greek drama and classical Greek drama itself begins with Thespis you may know the name, uh, the, the word thespian, now, that is in, in common usage. It derives its origin from thespis, the first tragedian, the first Greek tragedian. Okay, he's the father of tragedy, if you want. He created tragedy. So thespis was the person who somewhere around 600 BC created tragedy, fine. From Thespis now we will come to the three great canonical central Greek tragedians and they are and why I am talking about tragedy first because tragedy came first okay and comedy came 100 years after tragedy so of course tragedians and tragedy is first and then we will uh, mention uh, comedy writers and comedies right. So Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides. I repeat, Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides. These three people are the three greatest classical Greek tragedians. And uh, because we are not going to depth of them, but then I must tell you here that uh, Aristotle's Poetics mentions them and their drama and its uh, discussions are based on some of their plays. So I will mention some of their place. For example, with Aeschylus, you must remember the Orestesia trilogy. For uh, Sophocles, you must remember Rex Oedipus or King Oedipus. And for Euripides, do remember Medea. Okay, because Aristotle in his Poetics talks about the the difference between simple and complex plot of uh, Medea. That is simple plot without peripety and anagnosis. And uh, in another video, I've talked about uh, poetics. So if you are interested, you may go there. But I must mention here because Aristotle's poetics is the uh, first, uh, you know, work uh, that we have in the Western tradition on literary criticism, right? So in that first work of literary criticism, these great tragedians find mention. And that's why I talked about them. After them came the comedians, for example, Aristophanes, the old Greek comedy and Menander, the new comedy. Okay. Now from Greece, we come towards the Roman Empire and their uh, tragedy and comedy. Uh, our basic interest here is the relation between these tragedies and comedies and English tragedies and comedies. So the first name that comes to our mind is, of course, Seneca and his tragedies. And then, of course, Plotus and Terence and their comedies. So that is about, um, you know, classical Latin Roman comedies. From there, now we come towards the medieval age. We are not talking about the whole medieval Europe, although the continent must be mentioned because after the Norman conquest, the stream of uh, European thought and European literature entered England. But then, in general, the types of drama throughout Europe was more or less similar. So it was religious drama, plain and simple. Drama uh, as liturgical as Latin drama began early. But later on in vernaculars, in vernacular French, in German, in, in English, drama emerged. And it emerged first uh, in the form of religious drama. So, uh, of course, nativity, the birth of Christ was first portrayed as, as some kind of, um, uh, you know, panoram panoramic vision in form of models and all. And then later on, it was converted into a live uh, scene, nativity. Passion of Christ, again, the same thing happened. So from a scenery to a live projection of the same thing in form of characters, and that happened. 
Christian plays in general and then we are talking about mysteries and miracles. Now the differentiation was never done in English uh, drama. It was done in the continent that uh, stories from the testament will be called mysteries and stories from the lives of saints will be called miracles. But then that differentiation was not valid as far as English drama is concerned. And then of course uh, here now we have reached the stage when drama has left the, the whole building of the church. First it came out of uh, the church, the building of the church, then it reached the churchyard and then it left the churchyard and went into the hand of the guilds, various guilds that ran their own drama, especially due to the Corpus Christi peasants, uh, you know, the drama uh, on pageants became very popular. Like today we have in, in India also, we have Ram Leela that is uh, staged in various parts of a city. So some part becomes Lanka, some parts be part becomes Ayodhya, some part becomes Chitrakoot and so on and so forth. And throughout the city during the uh, Navaratri, Ram Leela is played. Some similar kind of thing was done with uh, Christ. And stories from Bible and stories from uh, Christ's life were played throughout the day uh, on pageants people stayed at their own place and the pageants they were they were with wheels so one pageant with one specific uh, kind of play by one specific guild would be staged at one place and after that it would be removed from that place people would remain seated and another pageant would come and the whole cycle was thus completed there are four very famous cycles but we are not going very deep into that um, because you know I'm mentioning and I'm covering the whole span so I have to go very fast. That is about medieval drama from mysteries and, and miracles and all these uh, cycles. We are now, now reaching moralities. Now moralities are conversion of abstract vices and virtues into characters and using those characters to give some message, moral if you want. These were heavy kind of things you know although comic element was introduced in even in mysteries and uh, and moralities like vice and devil were, were characters that introduced the touch of comic in moralities but basically the these were didactic in purpose and then came a totally fun thing the interlude right and this interlude was to to reduce the the uh, you know overall somber kind of gravity of whatever was happening on stage it was mindless fun totally interludes fine and now after all these things we have reached a stage when we can start talking about queen elizabeth and drama of her age which is the golden age for many kind of many genres of literature okay so queen elizabeth's age that is 1558 she became the queen 1603 she died 1603 james one jacobian age james one becomes uh, becomes the king and 1625 he dies so 1558 to 1625 is, you know, flowering and fruition of Renaissance drama in England, if you want. Renaissance is seen as running from 1500 to 1660, but uh, it, it took some time and Queen Elizabeth, um, you know, and her uh, stabilization of social culture and religious environment of England for finally uh, our playwrights and our poets to produce great literature. Right. So now we have reached Queen Elizabeth's age and uh, we will then look at it from the point of view of when Shakespeare entered the scene. So 1590s Shakespeare entered the scene. So we'll talk then about dramatist before Shakespeare, then William Shakespeare and dramatist after Shakespeare or his uh, juniors. Okay. So before Shakespeare, Professor Sainsbury has very rightly uh, given the term university wits. So Green, Peel, Nash, Lily, Kidd, Marlowe, they were called the university wits. Why? Because they had either studied in Oxford or Cambridge University. They were learned people and they were trying to create drama. Uh, probably many of them from classical models, borrowing from classical plot and structures, but they were trying to create English drama. So of course, the first English drama, tragedy and comedy are not written by them. They are written by schoolmasters. Ralph Royster, Doyster and uh, Gorboduck and Gamma Guten's Needle, all of them are by schoolmasters, okay? 
but then they were not professional playwrights and we're talking about the development of drama per se so of course we'll mention them 1552 1562 gorboduck and and uh, sorry uh needle and, and gorboduck but then when we talk about serious drama then we'll have to talk about the university wits and their drama their comedy and their tragedies and then we've got our william shakespeare himself right so the elizabethan and jacobian drama uh, was of course divided into tragedies and comedies another name for these tragedies and comedies are, is romantic tragedies and romantic comedies subdivided into various genres ben johnson was writing at the same time and he was writing comedy of humor but then william shakespeare was writing his comedies his tragedies his histories his romances uh, some of them are Shakespeare's plays are called Roman plays. Some of them are called history plays. Some of them are called problem plays. I, I'm only covering the the area. Every one of them can is you know is is a probable topic of one full lecture. But I'm covering the area. I'm I'm telling you who developed what. So Marlowe with Marlowe we have got the Renaissance hero, the overreaching hero, Tamerlane, Doctor Foster's, uh, the Machiavellian hero, Barabbas. You know. So with Marlowe, we have got the Renaissance coming, uh, uh, Renaissance spirit coming to the fore, and then that was brought to its fruition as far as theme, as far as language, as far as the depth of plot is concerned by William Shakespeare. But then Shakespeare was not alone, as T. S. Eliot has very ably shown, demonstrated uh, that there was Fletcher, there was Beaumont, there were so many other talented writers, and as far as tragedy is concerned, of course Webster was there, a Jacobean dramatist post Shakespeare so you know after Shakespeare you've got Beaumont Fletcher and uh, in among among tragedians you've got Webster that have remained in the canons that have remained in the various syllabi till date then we reach 1642 theater was closed up to 1660 so of course uh, uh, Devanant was doing theater he was even creating he had created a couple of operas and plays but then one or two is not such a big count right so from 1642 to 1660 we don't see a flourishing uh, trade of uh, uh, theater the business right and then 1660 charles ii comes back restoration of monarchy and theaters reopen and after the reopening the french influence is very much clear that that came with charles ii of course and the comedy of that time is called restoration comedy and the greatest example that is very much prescribed in your syllabi is of course the way of the world fine so from restoration comedy then with uh, that was very much opposed and very ably opposed in 1698 by jeremy colliers uh, and then finally it had to end it had to be changed because it was not very healthy it was not very balanced but still, restoration comedy was a rage in its own time and it was not a comedy for common people. It was a comedy for the members of the court and for the king and for the people, uh, for if you want, for people like, uh, uh, you know, Rochester and uh, the king's whole uh, circle of friends and gentlemen writers who wrote and enjoyed um, it at the same time. But these were not Renaissance men. These were different kind of people. Okay, when you read history of English literature, when we discuss history of English literature per se, and we talk about social cultural con context of English literature, then, uh, you know, we may talk about that. But at present, because we are talking only about drama and that too, I'm only taking you through the, the history of drama. So I'm not going deep into all these restoration comedy. That's that. And then we come to heroic drama. Heroic drama is the drama of Augustan age. Okay, and this drama is generally in, in rhyming couplets. Of course, All for Love by uh, Dryden is in blank verse, totally in blank verse, but heroic drama is equal to uh, rhyming couplets, you may say. And uh, the central character must be from, you know, some, some great station and the emotions and the actions involved must have some bearing upon the history of civilization or history of a nation if you want so this was bringing epic into theater heroic drama as pope himself uh, talked about had epical ambitions it took epical themes and epical characters and tried to create drama 
fine. So that is heroic drama. Uh, the conquest of Grenada is the copybook example of heroic drama. Okay. John Dryden. Now from heroic drama, we are coming towards the closet drama. But then before uh, we talk about closet drama, because there's a long range uh, of closet drama examples, I must also mention the sentimental drama. So uh, there was the restoration drama in which all the middle class uh, uh, norms were made fun of, morals were made fun of. Sentimental drama tried to revert it, tried to bring health into, into comedy. And for example, She Stoops to Conquer, you have, and, uh, you know, in, in that play, you get to see that somebody is um, abashedly, not unabashedly, somebody is abashedly flirtatious, but then gets tongue tied in front of uh, women of his own class, social class. Therefore, a girl of that class uh, literally stoops to conquer, right? So th this is a comparatively when you compare it with the kind of humor that the restoration comedy had. This is comparatively a very clean play, a very clean drama, right? So we have got Goldsmith <clears throat> and we've got School for Scandal by Sheridan that has a sentimental villain and that has got a rakish hero. And finally, we get to see that the purity of heart and emotions is much, much better than so-called decorum and polish. That was the thing, you know, sentiments and truth of heart was much, much more important than any kind of decorum, uh, neoclassical decorum that you are going to follow. So that is sentimental drama. And now we have come to closet drama. Closet drama is a drama that is meant to be read and not to be played. And the first example that comes to my mind is, uh, uh, of course, John Milton's Samson Agonistes. And then we, when we talk about uh, closet drama in the Romantic age, then we'll have to talk about Byron Manfred. We'll have to talk about uh, P.B. Shelley, for example. Uh, the Chenchi and Prometheus Unbound, the most famous closet drama, the Prometheus drama is, is very famous. The Chenchi is also famous, but then is, is not in the syllabi. Prometheus Unbound stays in the syllabi. We have got Beppo also. Uh, and then we come to the Victorian period. And again, we have got closet drama examples with uh, the most central poets, uh, Tennyson and Browning also uh, writing that kind of drama. But then Browning's dramatic energies went into his dramatic monologues. And then he did not, uh, you know, write many drama. So, and then the same happens with uh, Tennyson also. These, you know, Shelley, Tennyson, Browning, Milton, they were not primarily dramatists. They did write drama, but then they totally knew their, their limitations. Therefore, they kept their drama to be read, basically, right? So that is closet drama. Now we come towards the modern age and we come towards the realist drama. Realist drama is portrayal of life as it is, giving as many uh, factors as possible from life as it is lived to make people believe that they are seeing a piece of the world on the stage. Realist drama, method acting, all these words are coming from there. But then as a response to realist drama, was born expressionist drama in which the so-called reality and its portrayal of stage was not so very important in which expression of the emotional state became more important and instead of a well-made plot and even episodic structure would do if you could show if you could portray the central emotion or the turning points of emotions convincingly for example Eugene O'Neill's The Hairy Ape is a very famous example of eight scenes in which the, the predicament of Yank is totally shown, rather conveyed to the audience. You may remember Munch's, Munch's famous uh, uh, crayon drawing of uh, the scream, the person uh, screaming kind of thing. That is the era in which expressionism was flourishing. And it was flourishing throughout Europe and it was also flourishing in, in the United States of America. But then uh, O'Neill happens to be a very central canonical name. That's why I have mentioned O'Neill. Now we have come to the world wars and we have come to the destruction and we have come to the demoralization. But then before Second World War, we'll have the drama of ideas and social drama. So the drama of ideas is when action is not so very important, but ideas are important. For example, George Bernard Shaw and his, uh, say, uh, Arms and the Man in which he develops the idea of war not being good very ably, 
with the help of dialogues and not much action. And then we have uh, the social drama that presents a social problem and talks about a solution. For example, John Galsworthy's Justice, Strife and so on and so forth. And then we have finally reached the world wars and the second world war is over. Hitler has happened. The Holocaust has happened and people have lost faith in God, have lost faith in humanity. And we come to the theater of the absurd and we then talk about the one and only waiting for Godot. Samuel Bickett, Waiting for Godot, it's in every syllabus, in every MA course. I mean, as far as I've seen the syllabi, it's a central text, canonical text. And Waiting for Godot happens to be a direct comment on life as it was being lived. A purposeless life, one day same as the other, one place same as the other, one man same as, same as the other, and life same as death. And because God is dead, and human life is an accident because there is no cause and no humanity left. Therefore, it is exact portrayal of the absurdity of life and how it is lived on stage. Where nothing comes, nothing happens, no one comes, no one goes, ah, it's so boring. Uh, this is all about the types of drama. Uh, I hope that I could take you through this, uh, this terrain and I could be a good tour guide for you. Now, if you have liked this, please do click at the like button. And if you want more such videos and the intimations of all such videos to reach you, do subscribe. If there is something specific that you find very difficult and you want me to talk about, then do tell me. Uh, you can use winners.edge at gmail. Sorry, winners.edge.english at the rate gmail.com and mail me. You can, of course, put directly under, the, under this uh, video in the comment box and give me suggestions on what you want from me. Okay? So happy reading, happy growing. Thank you. With us, you win.